Hello and thanks for streaming this episode from ACF Church. Our hope is that this word would encourage you to walk closer with God and with your local church. We hope you consider partnering in the work God's doing here by joining a life group, serving, and giving. If you'd like to give financially to the mission of ACF Church, you can do so safely on our website at acfak.org or by texting the amount to 907-341-4213. Now prepare your hearts to hear God's word. everybody. Good morning. Welcome to church. It is great to be with you guys this morning. My name is Josh, and I'm one of the pastors here. And man, I just want to say thanks for joining us this morning. If you're a guest of ours, man, we're so grateful that you're here with us today, that you take some time out of your Sunday morning and come uh, spend it with us. And I also want to welcome everyone joining us in online. Can we just give them a hand? Everyone tuning in right now. Every week, people jump in on Facebook Live, uh, really from all over the world, and just kind of participate in this family and what's happening here today. And in fact, what we like to ask you guys to do is if you do have your cell phone with you right now, um, if you don't mind, you could jump on Facebook and you can share this. And it's just another vehicle, another way for people uh, to maybe experience church who are a little afraid to come or not sure about it and just kind of see what it's about online. And then maybe that will warm them up to coming to uh, church and, and just being part of the body of Christ here. So welcome, you guys. Thank you for being here today. Uh, man, I, I hope you guys had a great 4th of July. Um, I had a blast. Uh, tried to stay cool as best as I could. Um, we went and did the most, I don't know, American thing you could do maybe with no fireworks allowed, and that was to watch cars drive off cliffs, right? It was awesome. There's this car launch, if you've never heard of it, out in Glacier View, and they just do exactly that. They they send cars off cliffs, and it's awesome to watch, you know, because America, right? And even more than that, let's be honest, it's because Alaska, right? Because that's what we do for fun around here. Uh, I know it was a blast, and I hope you guys had a great, uh, great time and a great Fourth of July week. Um, and now we're here today, Sunday, and we are in the middle of a series called Who Needs Church? And we've been talking about this idea, this concept of uh, of people walking away from the church, like people not understanding what church is truly supposed to be all about. And we've talked about how Jesus died for this very thing, this thing called church. That this is one of the primary reasons Christ came and died. And yes, he died for us individually that we may know him and have a relationship with him. But as much, and even you could argue more than that, he came and he died for us together, corporately, for this thing that he calls his church. And so why it's something that is so important that, that Jesus would come and die for this very thing, how has it become where we don't see it as relevant anymore? And maybe not we as in you specifically, maybe you're someone who says, yeah, absolutely, church is so important to me, I get this, I need this. Or maybe you're someone in this room or watching online who's going, I don't get it, I don't know what's the big deal about church, I don't know why I need to give up my Sunday mornings, I don't know why I need to give up half of a, half of a day of my weekend to come to church, like, I don't get it, I don't know it. But I'm here, maybe someone drug me here, maybe someone talked me into coming, I'm just here to honor somebody else, but I don't get it. 
And to be honest with you, that's kind of where we're at as a nation. In, 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 our, in, our, in our country, we're in a place of so many people going, I don't get it. What's the big deal about church? And, and in reality, over like in, in European nations, it's, it's far worse. They've just kind of gone like, yeah, church, irrelevant, not needed, not important. And we're seeing that start to come over into our nation. Seeing church as irrelevant and, and a generation coming up going, I'm, yeah, no, I don't, I don't get it. I don't, I don't know why it's important. Who needs church? And so that's been the journey we've been talking about over the summer. And, and to help us understand what church is about, we've been walking through the book of Acts. And if you don't know and if you're not familiar with it, what the book of Acts is, really the book of Acts is a story. And it's not just a story, it's our story. It's a story of the birth of the church. It's our origin story. And I love it. This week we celebrated the 4th of July, and, and, and for us it's a big party. And, and I know majority people in this room are probably Americans. Probably not everybody. I know not everybody watching online is. But for, for us who are Americans, we celebrated the 4th of July, and we celebrate it for so many different reasons. And one of the reasons is like it's our origin. It's where we came from. It's how we got our identity, right? We, we celebrate things like tossing tea into the harbor. We celebrate things like crossing the Delaware in the middle of the winter. And we celebrate things like the flag still standing after all the bombs are done exploding. And we celebrate it because we look at it as part of our heritage of who we are. And it is. But what we want to understand and we, what we want to know is that we have another heritage. If you're a follower of Jesus in this room, if you've surrendered your life to him, you have a heritage that I would say runs far deeper than that heritage. Right, something else we're uh, kind of starting to become obsessed with um, today is like where we came from. Things like 23 and Me are, are just exploding. Everybody wants to know, where did I come from? Where, where are my beginnings? Where's my family from? What's in my blood? And as these things are exploding, we need to understand we have something that tells us where we have come from as the body of Christ. And we have this book called Acts, and again, I would argue that it is far deeper than even the blood that's in your veins right now. This heritage is deeper than that. It's deeper than that. It's deeper than being an American. It's deeper than being, you know, your family and who you are. This is the body of Christ. This is who we're going to be a part of for all of eternity. And it is what Jesus came to die for. And so we've been walking through this idea of who needs church, walking through the book of Acts so that we can understand what it's all about, what, what this, this thing called church is all about, what this family is all about. And we've been using Acts 1-8 as kind of our launch pad through this journey through the book. And Acts 1-8 says this, and it's Jesus talking, and he says, but you will receive, the Holy, uh, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So this is, this is the launching point of the church. Jesus says, look, I, I'm leaving now. I'm going to take off. And in fact, Jesus says, it's better that I leave so that the Holy Spirit can come. But don't worry. When, when I leave and the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to receive power and it's going to enable you to do something. And what is that thing? To be a witness. To be a witness. This is the calling that Jesus puts on, on his church is to be a witness. And we started this journey several weeks ago. And, and we started this journey with talking about that verse. And then we walked into Pentecost Sunday. And Pastor Jonathan was a guest of ours. And he did an amazing job preaching about that. And, and what it looked like when the Holy Spirit came. And what it means to actually be filled and empowered with the Holy Spirit. And what we started to understand is like, man, this, this thing called life and this journey that God has set us on and this, this calling that he's called us to, we can't do it without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We, we're not strong enough in ourselves, and we're going to look at that a little more today, but that it is through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, God has enabled us. In fact, again, like I said, Jesus said, look, it's better that I'm not here with you on earth physically so that you can be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do the work and the calling that you are called to do. And so 
we began this journey and we started to see what it looked like for the church to grow and to come alive and, and what it looked like to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, like the church is exploding, right? Thousands upon thousands of people are coming to Christ. And it's incredible when you really look at it, like what it looks like to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And I love one of the supreme examples of this in the beginning of Acts, at least, is, is this guy named Peter. This guy named Peter, and you may have heard of Peter before, you might know his story, but he was a disciple of Jesus. He, he lived with Jesus. He walked and he talked. He ate. He, he was with Jesus for three solid years. The Sermon on the Mount, Peter was there, right? The feeding of the 5,000, Peter was there. Not just there, but like participated in it. Like Peter saw every single miracle of Jesus. He saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. Right, and, 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 and Peter even got an inside glimpse that some of the disciples didn't. Peter got to see Jesus kind of in all of his glory. He saw Jesus on this thing we call transfigured, on the Mount of Transfiguration. All of a sudden, Elijah and Moses show up, and it's like, what's going on? And they're like, yes, confirming that Jesus is the fulfillment of all the laws and prophets. And Peter witnesses this. I love Peter. I love him because he's, he's the guy that like sees these things and then like still doesn't get it right. Right, I feel like I relate to Peter always sticking his foot in his mouth, always thinking he's right, right? Like he's like, I, I got this, I am right, but yet he's like really, really wrong. I feel like that's me so often, so I relate to Peter a lot, I love Peter, but what we see is like Peter spends all this time with Jesus and yet at the very end, when Jesus is on trial, where's Peter? Nowhere to be found, right? He's off hiding, denying Christ, Right, he's off, and it's not like he was denying Christ to like these Roman soldiers that are like, hey, weren't you one of his followers? And he's like, oh, no. No, it was like to probably like, like a teenage girl. I mean, we know it was a girl, and we, we figure she's about, probably about a teenager, and she's like, hey, weren't you like one of the, the guys that hung out with Jesus? He's like, no. Psh, not at all. And she asks him again, he's like, ah, no, 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 it's not me. You, you got the wrong guy. You know, I got one of those faces. I look like everybody. Like, I get confused a lot. This happens a lot. No. And she asks him again, like, no, 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 you, you, you were one of his followers. And he blows up on this girl, and he's like, starts cursing at her. No, I never knew the man. And of course, this is what Jesus predicted would happen. But how does a guy who spent three years with Jesus, saw all of these miracles, saw him, Jesus raise people from the dead, heard his sermons, literally saw Jesus in his glory, and yet denies him at this point, and we fast forward just a few months later, right, just like 40, 50 days later, and all of a sudden, Peter's a completely different guy. All of a sudden, we see Peter, and he's preaching the word of God. He's preaching Jesus. He's healing people, and he gets summoned to court, and they're like, hey, what, what's going on here? Why, did you, why are you preaching Jesus? And he's like, well, we're healing people, and clearly you can see that this guy could not walk, and now he can walk. And so, yeah, we're preaching Jesus, and, and the court system, the Sanhedrins, they don't know what to do with Peter and John, and so they're like, uh, don't do it again. And the old Peter probably would have gone, okay, whoo, dodged one, we won't do it again, thank you. But all of a sudden, Peter's empowered by the Holy Spirit, and so what, what does he do? He, he continues to preach the word of God. He continues to teach and preach Jesus, and all of a sudden, he gets brought to court again. And they're like, we told you not to do this, and now they don't know what to do with Peter and John because they have this massive following, like thousands and thousands of people are saying yes to Jesus. And so they're afraid to like put him in jail because like they're afraid of riots. They're afraid to like stone them and kill them because again, they're afraid of their followers rioting. So they're like, hey, we'll make an example of them. We'll show them what happens to people when they follow Jesus and they beat them. And I love this scripture. So if you've been reading through the, the book of Acts with us, Man, which I really encourage you to do. I just remember a few weeks ago reading this, and, and it says that Peter and John left, and they, they beat them, and then they release them, and said, don't do it again. And when Peter and John leave after being beaten, what do they do? They worship God and say, God, thank you that we were found worthy enough to be beaten for your word, for who you are. Can you imagine if that happened in America today? Like, it wasn't even like thugs that beat up Peter and John. It was the government can you imagine if all of a sudden cops show up here and they grab me and just start wailing on me, like, don't talk about Jesus again? 
Like, if that happened to you or that happened to me, would my reaction be like, thank you, Jesus, that you found me worthy? Yeah, I don't think it would be. Let's be honest. I'd be on my cell phone calling the first lawyer I can think of. Hey, we got some legal action here. I got my rights. But no, Peter and John are like, God, man, we are worthy to be beaten for you? Wow. Right, why? Again, Peter, like, two months earlier, is denying Jesus. What changed? What changed was the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. You see, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, what we read Jesus said was going to happen, was, was given to us so that the gospel could spread throughout the known world so that we would be his witnesses. And again, you guys, this is our heritage we're talking about. That same church that was founded on the day of Pentecost, that same church that is exploding in early acts, that's the same church we're a part of today. It's beautiful. It's been continuing. It's been growing. God hasn't stopped his work. He's continuing it today, but in the beginning of it, we see these crazy stories, these crazy events that are happening. And then last week, Pastor Brian talked about this really strange story about this married couple named Ananias and Sapphira and how they sell their property and they bring some of the proceeds to the church, but they tell the church they brought all of the proceeds, and when they do that, they drop dead. Just remember that during offering later today. Just <laughs> kidding. Just kidding. No, but, but what happens, and there's a reason this happens, and it's not just because God's like just angry at them. No, he's, he's protecting this, this thing, this, this family this, in its infant stages, this thing, this church. He's protecting it because really what's happening is Ananias and Sapphira are bringing in things like deceit into the church. They're bringing in greed into the church. They're bringing in like self-seeking glory into the church because really the reason they sold the property and like pretended to give all the money is because they wanted a, some of the fame that some of the other people were getting for doing this. And so th th it was about self-seeking glory, not giving glory to God. And God's like, I can't allow this. This thing is infant. It's new. It's fresh. We can't allow this to begin to spread through it right away. And so they, they fall down dead. And that really leads us into where we're at today, into Acts 6, and we're going we're gonna to talk about this man named Stephen and, and his part of, of our story. And so, and so what, what I want to set the scene for you guys of what's going on right now, and again, we're early Acts, the church has just started, I mean, we're talking weeks, months has this thing been around. And, and what we see is all of a sudden, as thousands and thousands of people 5,000 at a time, 3,000 at a time are, are coming to Jesus as more and more people are becoming part of this church. Inevitably, what is going to happen is when you get a whole bunch of people together, everyone gets along perfectly. No, it does not. Maybe your family is like this, but mine is not. Lock my kids in a room for an hour and they don't get along anymore. So people start not getting along. There starts to be like humanity within the church. Problems start to arise. And so I want to read this to you, uh, uh, Acts uh, 6, starting in verse 1. We'll read 1 through 5, and I'm going to talk about what's going on here. It says, Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in numbers, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick from among you seven men of good, uh, of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And it goes on in the story, that's the comma right there, not a period, and then they chose Philip, and it starts naming the seven men that they chose. <clears throat> so if you don't know what's going on here, and kind of why this is a, a bit of a big deal, it, is, it says that there arose a complaint of the Hellenists against the Hebrews. Now, who were the Hellenists? This is quite interesting when you start to understand really what's happening here is the Hellenists were Jews, but they were not from Jerusalem. The Hellenists were Jews, but they did not speak Hebrew or Aramaic. They spoke Greek. 
And so really what had happened was that you trace this back all the way to like the exile of Babylon. And then when the exile was over, there was a mass flood moving back to Jerusalem, all of the Jews. But for some different reasons, some Jews didn't make it back to Jerusalem. And so as the world continued to advance and Rome took over, they, they were from other parts of the world, but they were, they were Jews, but they didn't speak you know, Hebrew. They didn't speak Aramaic. They spoke Greek, and they weren't from Jerusalem. And, 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 and what's going on here, if, if you don't understand, is that there's actually racism happening in the early church because the, the Hebrew Jews saw them to be better. For us today, man, we deal with racism. It's a real issue. And, and, and we work it out, and, and we deal with it in our culture. We deal with it even in the church. But for them, for us, racism often, not always, but often starts with color of skin. For them, skin color did not matter at all. For them, and when we see in the ancient world, racism was really a, a lot more about things like the language you spoke. Or it was like where your heritage was traced back to. That's why the Jews hated the Samaritans. There was massive racism when it came to the Jews and the Samaritans, and it was all about their heritage, where they came from. And so we see this in the church, and, and the Hellenists are saying, hey, there's some shady stuff going on here. Like, the Hebrew widows are being taken care of. Our Hellenist widows, that, not so much. It's unfair portions or no portions at all. There's problems going on here in the church. And while this is even a problem, it's interesting, because I was, I was reading through this, and, and I start thinking, well, where did all these widows come from? Like, why do they all of a sudden need the church to support them? Because, again, the church has been around for months. So who was supporting these widows before it was a need of the church? And as I was doing research and I was just kind of reading some commentaries, what I realized was these widows, these Hellenist widows, and even the Hebrew widows, when they were saying yes to Jesus... When they, when they were getting baptized in water in the name of Jesus, many of them, if not all of them, were being cut off from their families. That their families were the ones who had been supporting them. If you were a widow, like by law, like your father-in-law, your brother-in-laws had to take care of you, your father, your brother, like that, that was like required. But now when you said yes to Jesus, you were choosing the family of God over your earthly family. And especially if they were Jews, it was like a big, big deal. And so they were being cut off, no more supported by their families. Now, it wasn't even just the widows this was happening to. This was everybody. And so what you see, you read things like, look, the, the, these new believers were selling everything they owned. They were selling their land. They were selling these things so that nobody had need. Well, the thing was, everybody had need because they were being cut off from their families to follow Christ, to be part of a different family. And so it wasn't like, oh, my land, I'll sell my land so that you can eat. It was like, oh, this is not even my land anymore. This is my family's land. And so, yeah, we need to sell the family property so that we can all eat. And when you, when you start to look at that, when you start to understand that what is happening here, what is happening here is that the, the body of Christ, this family, this church, it is our family. And not only is it our family you could argue it is more important than even our earthly families. I mean, Jesus even says, look, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. I came to divide fathers from sons. Right, and what is Jesus saying? That he wants us to fight each other? No, but what he's saying is, look, look, you choose me first. You choose God first. And when you choose me, you are entering into a family. It's, it's, the, it's the imagery of adoption that Paul talks about, that we're adopted into a new family. And that even includes a new family from our earthly family. And now I'm not saying our earthly families are not important. I'm not saying like, hey, you say yes to Jesus and you kick him to the curb. But what I'm saying is we need to have a mind shift. Like, do I first look to take care of my earthly family or do I first look to take care of my church family? Because for them, it wasn't even a question. The church family was their family. Do you care more for the church family or do you care more for your earthly family? And there's nothing wrong with taking care of your earthly family. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. We absolutely should do that. But where's the priority at? And for them, that's why, this is why this was an issue, because these widows had no way of being taken care of without their church family. 
And so we, we see this problem arise, and so then the solution by the disciples is, is, is a great solution. And they say, okay, look, we'll choose seven men to make sure everything's being taken care of and is fair. Because everybody's going to the disciples with all these issues, and all of a sudden they're, they're over here doing this work when they should be doing that work. And they're like, okay, we need to set up a little bit of a structure here. And really you kind of see the first structure of the church set up. So choose seven men that you trust, and they'll make sure that everything gets done right. And one of those men, his name is Stephen. And we're going to talk about Stephen now. I want to talk about kind of these three callings of Stephen in his life. And the first thing that we see of Stephen is Stephen is called to serve. He's chosen to serve. He's one of the seven that were chosen, and, 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 and the choosing was literally to serve. It was to serve the widows. It was to show up day in. It was daily distributions to show up daily and serve the widows. Make sure everything is above board. Make sure everything's being fair. Everything's being even. Everybody's being taken care of. It was a call to service. And it's interesting, when, when I read my Bible, I know it didn't actually, I don't think it showed it on the screen, um, but I, I think the way it's translated actually fits this better, but in my Bible, uh, in my, my paper Bible that I read, it says that they chose Stephen, and then it's parentheses. I think in the screen it showed commas, which is kind of the same thing a little bit, but it shows parentheses, and it says a man full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. And as I was reading through this story, just preparing for today, I just, that man, I couldn't get past that spot. Stephen, a man full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. And as I'm I'm remembering this man, again, Stephen, he's been a follower of Jesus for weeks, months at best. Right now, he was a man who grew up Jew. He, he was a follower of the law. I'm sure he did his best to honor the law and keep the Sabbath and do all those different things. And so, yeah, he was a, a man of integrity, but it doesn't say this about everybody else. It says this about Stephen. And the other men were men of integrity too, but he was a man full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. And two things kind of dawned on me on this. The first one is this. Again, Stephen's only been saved for like weeks, months at best. And yet in that short time, what's said about Stephen is he's full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. What that tells me is that you do not have to be a follower of Jesus for years and years and years before you can be filled with faith and of the Holy Spirit. That that is uh, is an option for you today. In fact, last Sunday, we had four people say yes to Jesus and commit their lives to him. Can we just celebrate that right now? We had four people say, yes, I want to surrender my life to Jesus. And if you're one of those four people in this room right now, I want you to hear this, that today you can be known as someone full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. It's not something that's saved for people who have been Christians for years and years and years, and you kind of reach this point in your faith. It's not saved for the elite, it's not saved for the elect, it's, it's for all of us, it is accessible for all of us today that we can be people who are full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit right now. And the other thing I, that came to me as I was reading this was, man, what does the parentheses of my life say? What is in the parentheses of my life? Josh, a man, what? Does it say full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit? What does it say? What does it say in your life? See, what's written in the parentheses, what's written in the parentheses is is what happens in the mundane. See, we write what's in the parentheses and we write it in the mundane. We write it on the flight line. Right? We write it in the field. We write it in our offices, with our families at night. We write it in biology 201, Tuesday afternoons at 1 p.m. In the mundane is when we write what's in the parentheses of our lives and what is said about us. What is being written about us in our parentheses. So Stephen is chosen to serve. The next thing we see is Stephen is chosen to preach. He's chosen to preach And we read this in Acts 6, 8. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and sign amongst the people. Then some of those belonging to the synagogue of the freemen, 
as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those of uh, Cilicia, and of Asia, rose up to dispute with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit to which he was speaking. So what we see here is Stephen is serving. He's called to be a servant. He's serving. And now he's chosen to preach. Now, he has not been dubbed a preacher. The apostles didn't come to him and go, okay, Stephen, now it's time for you to preach. I believe what we see here is in the midst of his service, in the midst of his doing his daily job, he begins to do the very thing that Jesus called us to do, to be a witness. And he starts becoming a witness for Christ. And he starts telling people about Jesus. And maybe it's his experience. We don't know exactly what he's doing. One thing we know he's doing is he's doing miraculous signs amongst the people, showing them who Jesus is. And what happens is people rise up to dispute him, to challenge him, to go, no, 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 it is not about Jesus. But the problem is the Holy Spirit's empowering Stephen's work. And so as, as they're lobbing in these, these shots at Stephen, he's just knocking them out of the park. And, and, and they can't dispute him. They can't dispute him as he continues to be empowered, as he continues to preach. And so what happens next? What we read what happens next in this story is these men, they get really frustrated, they get really angry. And so what they do is they go and they gather false witnesses against Stephen. Now, in their, in their law, in their tradition, you had to have a minimum of two witnesses to take somebody to court. So if you were to accuse somebody of something, you had to have at least two witnesses to accuse them. And so they get these false witnesses, and, and, and they gather together, they go to court and to accuse Stephen. And, and this is not just court. This is like the Supreme Court. It is the high council. And they accuse Stephen, and this is what they accuse him of. They accuse him of blaspheming, and they accuse him of blaspheming three things, the temple, the law, and God. They accuse Stephen of, of blaspheming against the temple, against the law, and against God. And each one of these carries its own death sentence. So the three of them together, I mean, they're trying to get him on something. And just a side note, what's really interesting is what they accused Jesus of, falsely, was blaspheming against the temple, against the law, and against God. And so this is their strategy to take out Stephen. And, and they bring Stephen to court and, and, and the, they, they bring him to court, and Stephen's allowed to give his defense. And what Stephen does next is quite amazing. Instead of bringing a defense, Stephen brings a sermon. He preaches. He, he takes the opportunity, and he preaches to them. He could have gone, look, these guys are lying. I can prove it. I have my own witnesses. And being a false witness, by the way, was extremely uh, punishable. It was extremely serious. So if Stephen could have proved that they are false witnesses, this would not have gone well for them. Stephen could have gone, no, 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 I, I am not blaspheming at all against these things. And these, they're liars. I have a whole crowd of people that can attest to what I've been teaching. But he doesn't do that. He goes, I have a captive audience right now. I have an opportunity. And Stephen goes on for the next chapter, for chapter 7, and he preaches a sermon. And we're not going to read through it right now. I want to encourage you to go home and read through it. But it can get a little confusing when you read it. But basically what Stephen does is he starts at the beginning of the Jewish faith. He starts at the very beginning with Abraham. And he walks this high council who know their history inside out and backwards. He walks them through their history. And he leads them to the point of Jesus. And he tries to get them to see and understand that it is all about Jesus, that, that the law and the prophets all point to Jesus. And then he calls them out. He says, look, I'm not the one who's been blaspheming the law. I'm not the one who's been blaspheming the temple. And I'm not the one who's been blaspheming God. You are. And not just you are, but your ancestors from the beginning have been doing this. He says, name one prophet that they did not persecute. And, and Stephen doesn't do this as a mic drop opportunity, like, yeah, what's up? What we see really, truly is Stephen is going, please, repent, turn to Jesus, see Jesus, do you see him? And as you can imagine, this sermon goes over really, really well with everybody. No, oh, they lose their minds. But you see, Stephen was chosen to preach. And finally, Stephen is chosen to die. Acts 7, 
starting in 54. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up, and the Son of Man is standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. They cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the, and the witnesses laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. Stephen is often called the first martyr of the Christian faith. I entitled my message today, Can I Get a Martyr? See, what the word martyr actually means is witness. The term martyr did not ha- you don't have to die to be a martyr, but you have to be a witness. But they started attaching the word, like the idea of death for your faith with martyrdom because there's really no greater way to be a witness for your faith, right? There's no greater way to say, I believe in what I'm telling you. This is not just a, an abstract idea or, or some good ideas to live by. This is not something that I do on the weekends. This is my life. And, and because of that, that's when they started attaching martyrdom to like people who died for their faith. Martyr means witness. And what did Jesus tell us that we're going to be? You are going to be my witness, my martyr in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. See, this thing was not supposed to just start and stay in one spot. It was supposed to be spread across the entire earth. It was worth Stephen's life. You see, it was not uncommon for Jews to die for their faith. In fact, about 200 years before this happened in the Roman Empire, there, 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 there was um, a Roman Caesar who wanted to kind of get rid of Judaism. And so what he started doing is he started trying to make the Jews break their own laws. He started trying to do things like make them eat pork and work on the Sabbath and break their own laws. And, and if they wouldn't do it, then he would kill them. But the common, this was, there's a common response as a Jew was dying and, and choosing not to partake in breaking their own customs and their own laws, there was like these sayings that they would say as they're dying, and and they went something like this. They would say, do not think our God has forsaken us. Just keep doing what you're doing and see if God doesn't torture you. That was a common saying that the Jews would say as they were dying for not breaking their own laws. But what we have here is something very different Stephen cries out, do not hold this sin against them. I love this this quote by N.T. Wright. If we knew nothing about Christianity except the facts that its martyrs called down blessings and forgiveness rather than curses and judgment on their torturers and executioners, we would have a central, though no doubt puzzling, insight into the whole business. There is, of course, only one explanation they really had learned something from Jesus who made, uh, who made loving one's enemies a central, non-negotiable part of his teaching. This idea that Stephen had been changed by the Holy Spirit and now instead of calling curses down on these men who falsely accused him, he calls down blessings on them. Stephen was called to die. You see, this very thing, this very act, this scene right here in Acts begins to change everything because what was happening was the church was centralized. It was in Jerusalem and pretty much Jerusalem alone. But then after this persecution starts happening and the Christians scatter throughout the earth. See, this was the vehicle that Jesus used for the Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is the beginning of it, and I will tell you that you and me, if you're a follower of Jesus, are products of Stephen's death. That throughout the earth, it's scattered, and now here we are today, 2,000 years later. That this was the vehicle that God used, and we are still to carry this banner 
to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so these callings on Stephen's life to be a servant, a call to preach, and a call to die, they are the same callings we have today. Are they not? See, the question a lot of people ask when they read the story of Stephen is like, oh, would you be willing to die for your faith? Would you be willing to die for your faith? And, and I, I like to think I would say yes, and I do believe uh, when you read Scripture, you see a supernatural, spirit-empowered moment for Christians to be able to walk through this that I don't believe anyone experiences except in that moment. And so it, it would not be on the strength of Josh Talbot, I can guarantee you that. But would I be willing to die for my faith? I, I'd like to say yes, but in, let's, let's be real. In this room, we really have no idea what that would look like. Right, like we see it in other parts of the world, but we can't truly put ourselves in that mindset because we've, in this nation, never experienced things like that truly, and especially today. And so I think for us, even the harder question is not would you be willing to die for your faith, but hey, are you actually willing to live for your faith? Can I get a martyr in this room to live and be a witness for Jesus in your everyday life, not just on Sundays, because this is the family of God. This is our family. And this is who we get to spend eternity with. Like God is building something in this world. He's been building it really since the beginning. But he's empowering us now through his Holy Spirit to continue to take it into our lives and into our world. See, we are called to serve. Stephen was called to serve. We are called to serve. 1 Peter 4.10 it says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever, spe uh, whoever speaks as one who speaks an oracle of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified throughout Jesus or through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. See, Stephen was called to serve, but he, he was also called to teach. He was called to teach, and he took those opportunities to teach. And you may think, man, I don't have a seminary degree. It doesn't matter. Neither did Stephen. Right? You might think, well, I've only been a Christian for one week. Today marks one week. I said yes to Jesus last week. Awesome. You are called to teach. What do I teach? You're a witness. A witness to what God has done in your life. A witness to what you've seen Jesus do in your life. We're called to teach. Matthew 28, 19, Jesus tells us this. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the ends of the age. Jesus says, look, what is the command? It's to go and to teach. Teach what? All the things that you've learned, all the things that you know. I only know a week. Great, teach a week. Right, teaching them all those things that you've observed that I've commanded you, and I will be with you. Right, we are called to teach. Are we teaching those around us in our everyday lives? Not on foreign mission trips, not once a year in Ensenada, Mexico, or going off to Bobo or a Czech Republic team leaving soon. Like, that's great, and we need to be doing that, but that's not for the elect few. The teach is for all of us every day. And then finally, Stephen was called to die. We, we are called to die. Luke 9, 23, this is again Jesus talking, and he says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. We're called to die, not just die, but die Daily. You see, this is, this is life and death, eternity. But here's the good news. You're like, Josh, I can't do this. <laughs> You're right, and neither can I. And that is the best news. That is the best news because it's not up to you to just grit your teeth to power through this. All right, I'm going to die daily today. I'm going to be strong enough. I'm going to be smart enough to teach. No. Oh. So you're missing the point. It's all through the 
the power of the Holy Spirit that we're able to do any of this. Stephen didn't lay down this amazing sermon because he'd been working on it for months. It was the Holy Spirit acting in him. So the thing is, are we allowing the Holy Spirit to fill us every day? What does that look like? Man, more of Jesus today and less of you. That you'd wake up, Holy Spirit, fill me today to serve, to teach, and to die today for those around me. See, who needs church? I do. Because I can't do that without the support, without the edification, without the love, without the prayers of my family. Who needs church? You do. You can't do it either. That is the point of this family. That is the point of the church, that it's a movement and that we support each other as we walk out Acts 1-8, to be filled and empowered with the Holy Spirit, to bring the gospel to Jerusalem, Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So would you join me today? Would you join me to be someone who serves, to be someone who teaches, and to be someone who dies every day for the sake of the gospel? And if you're in this room and, and you're not a follower of Jesus, you need to understand and you need to know that this good news, this gospel, it is open for you, that there is a family that is ready and waiting to embrace you and accept you. And yeah, you know, it's messy. and It is not perfect. And if you've ever had the impression that Christians are perfect or that their pastors are perfect or that there's any perfection going on in this room, I'm sorry you've been misled. You'll fit right in. Right? The only perfection is that that comes through Christ. And he's made available to you today. Like I said, you don't have to be someone who's walked with Jesus for years and years and years and years and years to be someone who is full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit that's made available to you today. Let's go ahead and close with prayer. Jesus, thank you for our history. Thank you for our heritage. Thank you, God, that you set something into motion that you knew so much more than we ever could, that we needed your Holy Spirit, God, that that is the the very blessing of this all, is that it's not through our strength. It is not through me being strong enough, because I never, ever could be. But God, that you said, I'll be strong for you. I will empower you to do this work. God, that you've chosen to partner with us. You don't need us at all. But God, you have chosen to partner with us that you want your family, you want your followers to be able to be part of the work because there's a blessing in that work of of presenting the gospel. And as we've seen through Stephen's life, God, through his life and through his death, Jesus, that there is an amazing blessing that comes with this and through this. And God, may we learn from the life of Stephen. May we learn through the life of Stephen, God, that we would be people willing to serve each other. We'd be people willing to make sure that your, your family and our family is being taken care of. God, that we would even look to our church family and go, man, this is the priority. Because it is what we all have together. We've been adopted into this beautiful beautiful family, God. And God, may we be like Stephen and, 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 and be, not be afraid, but that we'd step out and teach, God, teach what we know, that we'd be witnesses for you, God. And then if I know a week of Jesus, that I would teach a week of Jesus. And if I know 50 years of Jesus, that I would teach 50 years of Jesus to those around me, that I would find those opportunities God, that it wouldn't be some weird thing, some that I feel like I have to do, but it would just be in my everyday life that I'd be so filled with you that I couldn't help but talk about you and to love you and teach about you. And God, may we learn from Stephen and be people willing to die. And as you commanded us to, not just die, but even die daily, that we would be martyrs for you, that we would be witnesses for you. And God, as we take up our cross and die daily, God, that we would be filled more and more with you. There'd be less of us. God, and if we struggle with these sins that, that so easily entangle us, God, that, that as we're filled more and more with you, that we'd find that victory that you have already purchased, that we'd find that victory in those areas of our lives. 
And finally, God, if there's anyone here who does not know you, God, but that, that knows that there's more to this life than just living for the weekend, that knows that there has to be so much more, that there's, that there's a family available for them, God, that there's forgiveness for their sins, that there's grace to them, and that there's a family ready to embrace them. God, that they would make that decision today, right now, to say yes to you. We love you, Jesus. We thank you. God, and we glorify you. May yours be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen.